After being visited in his hotel by two Swiss detectives, Ashenden felt he needed to relax. He ran a bath that was as hot as he could reasonably bear and slid gingerly into the water. Admittedly, the two officers had discovered nothing incriminating, but Ashenden lay wondering who could have denounced him to the authorities. He was just deciding that the bathwater had grown too tepid when he heard someone knocking at his bedroom door. Who is it? he called. A letter. Come in then. Wait a minute. Getting out of the bath, Ashenden flung a towel around him and went into the bedroom. A page boy was waiting with a note. It was from a lady staying in the hotel, asking him to play bridge after dinner, and was signed in the continental fashion, Baron de Higgins. Ashenden, longing for a cosy meal in his room, in slippers and with a book, was about to refuse, when it occurred to him that in the circumstances it might be discreet to show himself in the dining room that night. The news would certainly have spread around the hotel that he'd been visited by the police, and it would be as well to prove to his fellow guests that he was not at all put out. It had passed through his mind that it might be someone in the hotel who denounced him, and indeed the name of the sprightly baroness had suggested itself. He gave the boy a message that he'd be pleased to come, and proceeded to don his evening clothes. The baroness von Higgins was an Austrian. On settling in Geneva during the first winter of the war, she'd found it convenient to drop the von in favour of de. Her surname she owed to her grandfather, a Yorkshire stable boy, who'd been taken over to Austria by a Prince Blankenstein early in the 19th century. Higgins had had a romantic career. Very good-looking, he'd attracted the attention of one of the archduchesses and then made such good use of his opportunities that he ended his life as a baron and minister plenipotentiary to an Italian court. The baroness, his only descendant, had resumed her maiden name after an unhappy marriage. She mentioned not infrequently that her grandfather had been an ambassador, but never that he'd been a stable boy. Ashenden had learned this interesting detail from Vienna, for as he grew friendly with her, he'd thought it necessary to get a few particulars about her. He knew, among other things, that her private income didn't permit her to live on the somewhat lavish scale she enjoyed in Geneva. Well equipped for espionage as she was, it was fairly safe to suppose that an alert German secret service had enlisted her services. If anything, it increased the cordiality of his relations with her. When he went into the dining room, the baroness gave him a flashing smile. She was a woman of more than forty, a high-coloured blonde with golden hair of a metallic luster, and extremely beautiful in a hard and glittering manner. Ashenden thought that the mere sight of her must arouse a sense of prudence in anyone on whom she desired to exercise her wiles. While he waited for his dinner to be served, Ashenden cast his eyes over the company. At that time, Geneva was a hotbed of intrigue, and its home was the hotel at which Ashenden was staying. There were Frenchmen, Italians and Russians, Turks, Romanians, Greeks and Egyptians. There was a little German prostitute with china blue eyes and a doll-like face who made frequent journeys along the lake and up to Bern and in the exercise of her profession got little titbits of information over which doubtless they deliberated in Berlin. Ashenden was surprised to catch sight of Count von Hutzminden, the German agent in Vevey, who came over to Geneva only on occasion. Ashenden had known the Count fairly well in London before the war, a tall, thin fellow in well-cut clothes with a close-cropped Prussian head. He was fond of England. He danced well, rode well, and shot well. People said he was more English than the English. He had charming manners and was much interested in the fine arts. Now Ashenden and he pretended they'd never seen one another before, for each, of course, knew the work on which the other was engaged. Ashenden was perplexed. Holtzminden had never set foot in that hotel before, and it was unlikely that he'd done so now without good reason. Ashenden asked himself whether it had anything to do with the unusual presence in the dining room of Prince Ali. Prince Ali was an Egyptian, 
a near relation of the Khedive. When the Khedive was deposed, Prince Ali had fled his country. A bitter enemy of the English, he was known to be stirring up trouble in Egypt. The week before, the Khedive, in great secrecy, had spent three days at the hotel, and the pair of them had held constant meetings in the prince's apartments. Prince Ali was a little fat man with a heavy black moustache. He was living with his two daughters and a certain pasha, Mustafa by name, who was his secretary and managed his affairs. The four of them were now dining together in a stolid silence. The two princesses were emancipated young women who spent their nights dancing in restaurants with the bloods of Geneva. Short and stout, with fine black eyes and heavy, sallow faces, they were dressed with a rich loudness that suggested the fish market at Cairo rather than the Rue de la Paix. His Highness usually ate upstairs, but the princesses dined every evening in the public dining room. They were chaperoned vaguely by a little old Englishwoman, a Miss King, who'd been their governess. But she sat at a table by herself, and they appeared to pay no attention to her. On his arrival, Ashenden had tried to scrape acquaintance with Miss King, but she'd received his advances with frigidity. She was a tiny woman, just a few little bones in a bag of wrinkled skin. It was obvious that she wore a wig, mousy brown and not always set quite straight, and she was heavily made up, with great patches of scarlet on her withered cheeks and brilliantly red lips. She dressed fantastically, in garments that looked as though they'd been bought higgledy-piggledy from an old clothes shop. She wore extravagantly girlish hats and tripped along in very small, smart shoes with very high heels. Her appearance was so gruesome that people turned in the street and stared at her. Ashenden was told that Miss King hadn't been to England since she was first engaged as governess to the prince's mother. Ashenden wondered where she came from. An exile from her country for so long, she must possess in it neither family nor friends. He knew her sentiments were anti-English, and she never spoke anything but French, though in a strong English accent. She appeared actively to dislike him. When her gaze met his... He imagined that she'd tried to put into her stare an unspoken insult. In that painted, withered visage, it was for some reason rather oddly pathetic. But now the Baroness de Higgins, having finished her dinner, gathered up her handkerchief and her bag, and with waiters bowing on either side, sailed down the spacious room. She stopped at Ashenden's table. She looked magnificent. I'm so glad you can pay bridge tonight. Will you come to my sitting room when you are ready and have your coffee? What a lovely dress, said Ashenden. It is frightful. I have nothing to wear. I don't know what I shall do now that I cannot go to Paris. She raised her voice. Those horrible Prussians. Why did they want to drag my poor country into this terrible war? She gave a flashing smile and sailed on. Ashenden was among the last to finish, and when he left the dining room, it was almost empty. As he walked past Count Holtzminden, he hazarded the shadow of a wink. The German agent couldn't be quite sure of it, and if he suspected it, might rack his brains to discover what mystery it portended. Ashenden walked up to the second floor and knocked at the Baroness's door. She flung it open, shook both his hands with cordiality, and drew him into the room. He saw that the two persons who were to make the four had already arrived. They were Prince Ali and his secretary. Ashenden was astounded. "'Allow me to introduce Mr. Ashenden to your highness,' said the baroness. Ashenden bowed and took the proffered hand. Madame de Higgins went on. "'Have you met the pasha?' "'The prince's secretary,' shook his hand warmly. "'I am delighted to make your acquaintance, Mr. Ashenden.' Mustafa Pasha was a huge, fat fellow of forty-five, perhaps, with large, mobile eyes and a big black moustache. He wore a dinner jacket with a large diamond in his shirt front and the fez, or tabouche, of his country. Having provided her guests with coffee and liqueurs, the baroness produced the cards— 
Ashenden couldn't help wondering why he'd been asked to play. The game was obviously a pretext, and Ashenden had no notion what other game was being played. He'd felt for a day or two that something was in the air, and this meeting confirmed his suspicions. But he hadn't the faintest notion what this something was. He was now persuaded that he owed that visit of the Swiss police to the kindly intervention of the Baroness, and it looked as though the bridge party had been arranged when it was discovered that the detectives had been able to do nothing. The notion was mysterious, but diverting, and as Ashenden played, he watched what was said by himself no less closely than what was said by the others. At one moment he had a suspicion that he was being sounded upon the possibility of selling himself. It was done so discreetly that he couldn't be quite sure, but a suggestion seemed floating in the air that a clever writer could do his country a good turn and make a vast amount of money for himself if he cared to enter into an arrangement that would bring to a troubled world the peace that every humane man must so sincerely desire. It was plain that nothing very much would be said that first evening, but Ashenden, as evasively as he could, more by general amiability than by words, tried to indicate that he was willing to hear more of the subject. But while he talked with the Pasha and the beautiful Austrian, he was conscious that the watchful eyes of Prince Ali were upon him, and he had an uneasy suspicion that they read too much of his thoughts. Soon after midnight, a rubber ended, and the prince rose. It's getting late, and Mr. Ashenden has doubtless much to do tomorrow. We must not keep him up. Ashenden looked on this as a signal to take himself off. When he got to his room, he suddenly realized that he was dog tired, and the moment he flung himself into bed, he fell asleep. He'd have sworn that he hadn't been asleep five minutes when he was dragged back to wakefulness by a knocking at the door. Who is it? Is the maid? Open up, I have something to say to you. Cursing, Ashenden unlocked and opened the door. Outside stood a tousled Swiss maid, looking as though she'd thrown on her clothes in a hurry. The old English lady, the governess of the Egyptian princesses, is dying, and she wants to see you. Me, said Ashenden. I don't know her. She asks for you. The doctor says, will you come? She cannot last much longer. It must be a mistake. She can't want me. She said your name and the number of your room. She says, quick, quick. Ashenden shrugged. He went back into his room to put on slippers and a dressing gown, and as an afterthought dropped a small revolver into his pocket. It was ridiculous to suppose that those two cordial, stout Egyptian gentlemen were laying some kind of trap for him, but in the work upon which Ashenden was engaged, the dullness of routine was apt now and again to slip quite shamelessly into melodrama. Miss King's room was two floors higher than Ashenden's, and as he accompanied the chambermaid along the corridor and up the stairs, he asked her what was the matter with the old governess. I think she has had a stroke. I don't know. The night porter woke me and said Monsieur Bridet wanted me to get up at once. Monsieur Bridet was the assistant manager. When the maid knocked at Miss King's door, it was Monsieur Bridet who opened it. He'd evidently been roused from his sleep. He wore slippers on his bare feet, grey trousers and a frock coat over his pyjamas. He looked absurd. A thousand excuses for disturbing you, Monsieur Ashenden, but she kept asking for you and the doctor said you should be sent for. It doesn't matter at all. Ashenden walked in. It was a small back room and all the lights were on. The windows were closed and the curtains drawn. It was intensely hot. The doctor, a bearded, grizzled Swiss, was standing at the bedside. Monsieur Bridet, notwithstanding his evident harassment, remained the attentive manager and effected the proper introduction. This is uh, Mr. Ashenden, for whom Miss King has been asking, uh, Dr. Arbo of the Faculty of Medicine of Geneva. Without a word, the doctor pointed to the bed. On it lay Miss King. He gave Ashenden a shock to look at her. She wore a large white cotton nightcap. He noticed the brown wig on a stand on the dressing table and a white, voluminous nightdress that came high up in the neck. 
Her face was still greasy with the cream she'd used before going to bed to remove her makeup, but she had removed it summarily, and there were streaks of black on her eyebrows and of red on her cheeks. She looked very small, lying in the bed, no larger than a child, and immensely old. She must be well over eighty, thought Ashenden. She lay perfectly still on her back, the tiny body hardly marked under the blanket, her face even smaller than usual because she'd removed her teeth. You'd have thought she was dead but for the black eyes, strangely large in the shrunken mask that stared unblinkingly. Ashenden thought their expression changed when she saw him. Well, I'm sorry to see you like this, he said. She cannot speak, said the doctor. She had another little stroke when the maid went to fetch you. I have just given her an injection. She may partly recover the use of her tongue in a little while. She has something to say to you. I'll gladly wait, said Ashenden. He fancied that in those dark eyes he saw a look of relief. For a moment or two the four of them stood round the bed and stared at the dying woman. Well, said Monsieur Bridet, if there's nothing I can do, I may just as well go back to bed. Allez, mon ami, said the doctor. You can do nothing. Monsieur Bridet turned to Ashenden. May I have a word with you? Certainly. The doctor noticed a sudden fear in Miss King's eyes. Do not be alarmed. Monsieur Ashenden is not going. He will stay as long as you wish. The assistant manager took Ashenden to the door and partly closed it so that those within should not hear. Monsieur Ashenden, it is a very disagreeable thing to have anyone die in a hotel. The other guests do not like it, and we must do all we can to prevent their knowing. I shall have the body removed the first possible moment, and I shall be extremely obliged if you will not say that there has been a death. You can have every confidence in me, said Ashenden. Of course, if it had been possible, I would have sent for an ambulance and had her taken to the hospital. But the doctor said she might die before we got her downstairs, and absolutely refused to let me. It is not my fault if she dies in the hotel. Death so often chooses its moments without consideration, murmured Ashenden. After all, said Monsieur Bridet, she is an old woman. She should have died years ago. Why did this Egyptian prince want to have a governess of that age? He ought to have sent her back to her own country. Where is the prince now? asked Ashenden. She has been in his service for many years. Ought you not to wake him? He is not in the hotel. Uh, he went out with his secretary. He may be playing baccarat. I do not know. Anyhow, I cannot send all over Geneva to find him. And the princesses? Oh, they have not come in. They seldom return to the hotel till dawn. I do not know where they are. In any case, they would not thank me for dragging them away from their diversions because their governess has had a stroke. I know what they are. The night porter will tell them when they arrive, and then they can please themselves. She does not want them. When the night porter fetched me and I went into her room, I asked where his highness was, and she cried, No, no. She could talk, then, after a fashion. But the thing that surprised me was that she spoke in English. She always insisted on talking French. You know she hated the English. What did she want with me? That I cannot tell you. She says she had something that she must say to you at once. It is funny she knew the number of your room. At first, when she asked for you, I would not let them send. I cannot have my clients disturbed in the middle of the night because a crazy old woman asked for them. But when the doctor came, he insisted. She gave us no peace, and when I said she must wait till morning, she cried. Ashenden looked at the assistant manager. He seemed to find nothing at all touching in the scene he related. Well, I shall try to get a little sleep. 
I shall give the night porter orders to wake me when everything is over. If everything goes well, we may be able to get the body away before it is light. Ashenden went back into the room, and immediately the dark eyes of the dying woman fixed upon him. You do not mind waiting? asked the doctor. Of course not. But tell me what happened. How was Miss King discovered? The doctor described the events of the evening as they'd been told to him. It appeared that the night porter had been roused by the ringing of the telephone from Miss King's room, but could get no one to speak. He put down the receiver, but the bell had continued to ring, so he went upstairs and knocked at the door. Receiving no reply, he'd entered with his passkey and found Miss King lying on the floor. And now, said the doctor, there is really nothing more that I can do. He patted her rattled cheek as though she were a child. You must try to sleep. I will come back in the morning. He shuffled himself into a heavy coat and picked up his bag. Ashenden accompanied him to the door. Coming back, he looked at the maid. She sat on the edge of a chair, uneasily, her broad, ugly face bloated with fatigue. There's no use in your staying up, said Ashenden. Why don't you go to bed? Monsieur wouldn't like to remain here alone. Somebody must stay with him. But good heavens, why? You have your day's work to do tomorrow. She rose heavily to her feet. As the gentleman wishes. But I will stay very willingly. Ashenden smiled and shook his head. She went out, and Ashenden was left alone. He sat by the bedside, and again his eyes met Miss King's. It was embarrassing to encounter that unshrinking stare. Don't worry yourself, Miss King. You've had a slight stroke. I'm sure your speech will come back to you in a minute. He felt certain then that he saw in those dark eyes a desperate effort to speak. He could not be mistaken. The mind was shaken by desire, but the paralyzed body was incapable of obedience. Her disappointment expressed itself quite plainly. Tears came to her eyes and ran down her cheeks. Ashenden took out his handkerchief and dried them. Don't distress yourself, Miss King. Have a little patience, and I'm sure you'll be able to say anything you want. He didn't know if he read in her eyes now the despairing thought that she had no time to wait. Perhaps it was only that he ascribed to her the notions that came to himself. Wouldn't you be more comfortable if I turned out some of the lights? said Ashenden. He put out all the lamps but the one by the bedside, and then sat down again. Once more his eyes were held by those other eyes which contained all that remained alive of that old, old woman. He felt certain that she had something that she wanted urgently to say to him. But what was it? Perhaps she'd asked him only because, feeling death near, she'd had a sudden yearning to die with someone of her own people, so long forgotten, by her side. But why send for him? There were other English people in the hotel. Have you got something to say to me, Miss King? He had tried to read an answer in her eyes. They continued to stare at him meaningfully, but what the meaning was, he had no notion. Those black eyes seemed to glow mysteriously, as though there were fires behind them, holding him with that insistent stare. Then Ashenden asked himself if she'd sent for him because she knew that he was a British agent. Was it possible that, at the moment of death, a love for her country that had been dead for half a century awakened again in her, and she'd been seized with a desire to do something for what was, after all, her own? Ashenden, his common sense protesting, became strangely convinced that she had some secret that she wished to impart to him. She'd sent for him, knowing who he was, because he could make use of it. Ashenden leaned forward, trying more eagerly to read what her eyes had to say, how much that old woman must know. 
Once again, Ashenden remembered how he'd had the impression that something of real consequence was being prepared round about him. It was curious that Holtzminden should have come to the hotel that day. And why had Prince Ali and the Pasha, those wild gamblers, wasted an evening in playing contract bridge with him? It might be that the very greatest affairs were afoot, and perhaps what the old woman had to say might make all the difference, might mean defeat or victory. And there she lay, powerless to speak. For a long time, Ashenden stared at her in silence. Suddenly, he said, Has it got anything to do with the war, Miss King? Something passed through her eyes, and a tremor shot across her little old face. Something strange and horrible was happening, and Ashenden held his breath. The tiny, frail body was suddenly convulsed, and the old woman, as though by a final, desperate effort of will, raised herself up in the bed. Ashenden sprang forward to support her. England, she said, just that one word, and fell back in his arms. When he laid her down on the pillow, he saw that she was dead. <laughs>